So I'm Adam, a climate scientist with a PhD from Oxford, sharing what you need to know about climate change. And today I don't actually want to talk about climate change science. Actually, that's not true. I would really love to talk about climate change science. In fact, there's a paper from way back in September that I've been meaning to talk about on this channel since September, and then things have kept getting in the way in terms of things that I just feel like I absolutely have to talk about right now, whether that's climate negotiations or hurricanes or whatever it is. And so instead today, for what I think will be my last video of the year, I thought I'd like to talk about what it's actually felt like being a climate scientist and someone who talks about climate change in 2024. Because it's not been great. It's been a really, really rough year. Um, and a big part of that has been watching what's happening in the natural world, in our climate, seeing temperatures absolutely soaring and seeing the profound consequences of that on people's lives, especially the people who are the most vulnerable. And then on top of that, on top of all that urgency, on top of the fact that we're pushing 1.5 degrees, by the way, uh, you'll see headlines saying that we've already passed 1.5 degrees, but I discuss in this video up here why uh, that probably isn't the case yet. Um, but still, either way, we're pushing that limit and we're seeing just how severe the consequences of this level of global warming are for us, for the natural world. And then we're met with that by the political situation we're seeing around the world, where the climate negotiations we've just had were among the worst I can remember in terms of how seriously they took the problem. Um, and then uh, we're seeing politicians being elected who, instead of prioritizing this very real, very important danger, are prioritizing scapegoating and dividing people rather than trying to actually bring people together to fight this threat, which will affect all of us, even though it won't affect all of us in the same way. And that's just been really difficult to take, to see the urgency of the situation uh, combined with the political apathy at the absolute best and actively making the situation worse at the absolute worst. And on top of all that, we're still seeing people, countries around the world prioritizing destruction and death and funding destruction and death over tackling this existential problem that we as a planet, as people are facing. And I've spoken about that before on this channel, about how armed conflict contributes to climate change and how climate change contributes to armed conflict. But I can't believe that so many months later, after I last spoke about it on the channel, the situation is still ongoing, which actually doesn't do it justice. These situations have got so much worse and so many innocent people are losing everything, their, their homes, their way of life, their lives. And the idea that that is what we prioritize as a society, this destruction, this devastation, as opposed to addressing something which affects, affects all of us in one way or another, is really, is really, really difficult to take. Now, there's something else which is really, really difficult to take, which is how a lot of people react to this. And this can include me as well. It's very easy to look at the situation of the world both in terms of where the climate is today and where the politics are today, and to think game over and just to adapt a mindset of despair. Um, and there are definitely moments, truth be told, when I feel really overwhelmed. Um, but everything that I know as a climate scientist is that every single bit of emissions matters. Every aspect of the climate which affects our lives, which affects ecosystems, gets worse the more we emit. And that includes things like tipping points, which are much more likely to happen the more that we emit. Now, why is that in any way an antidote to despair? Well, because the opposite is also true. Even if we get to this situation that we've got to in 2024, which is not a situation that us as climate scientists would particularly like us to be in, we know that every bit of emissions that we can avoid 
means a bit of warming we can avoid, means lives saved and a more livable planet for the future. And I'm not saying this to, to fill you all with hope or anything like that, but just to remind you that despair is not backed up by the science. And I would also say this, because often I get these messages saying, oh, Adam just is pushing a message of hope or something like that. Honestly, I don't know whether hope is the word I would use for myself or the word that I would use for what I want to convey. But I heard someone a lot wiser than me once say, uh, the opposite of despair isn't hope, it's action. And I absolutely believe this is true. And I also believe this is true when I see people really trying to convince themselves and convince other people that despair is the way to go. I think often what they're really trying to convince themselves and other people of is that there's no point in taking action. And everything we know about the climate system, about the ecological system, about the human systems shows that there's still a huge point, a bigger point than there ever has been in taking as much action as we can to try and limit the heating that we see. But while we're talking about what needs to change, there are some things which genuinely do give me hope. I find it amazing speaking with all of you and seeing all of you tuning in and caring and wanting to do things in your lives that affect change. I find it amazing seeing the people in my everyday life and people in my wider circles thinking and talking about climate change in a way which is integrated with their lives and was honestly simply unimaginable just a few years ago. I find it incredible how incredibly cheap renewables have become all across the world, how countries all across the world have committed to giving up fossil fuels. I find it incredible to see so many people taking climate action in so many different ways, whether that's reflecting on their own emissions, talking about climate change in meaningful ways, or pushing for the structural changes that we desperately need. And so on this channel, I want to really support you all in doing all of those things in your lives and understanding the way that our lives are affected by climate change and can also affect climate change. And that's something that has always been my goal to help people understand how their lives are linked to climate change and its solutions. And that's something that I really hope to continue and to continue with all of you long, long into the future. But there is actually something else that gives me, I guess, hope and helps me keep working on climate change when things seem quite overwhelming. And it's going to seem quite random and also quite cliche at the same time, because what it is, is this, which is my knitting. Um, and now there are a few reasons why knitting is just wonderful for me and I absolutely love it. One is I did it as a child and it's amazing to take it back up as an adult. Another is that it's awesome to occupy your mind and your hands and it really feels like a kind of, I guess, self-care to knit. And the other is that I really see a lot of parallels between acting on climate change and knitting. This sounds ridiculous, I know. Um, but... When it comes to knitting, obviously the end goal, at least for me, is to finish the scarf or the sweater or whatever it is that I'm working on. But if I'm thinking about all the time, this has to be a sweater, well, I'm doing the literal tens of thousands of stitches that are required to get to that point. I never get anything done because the end goal seems so impossibly far away. But if instead I focus on the individual stitches, the individual rows, how to do them as well as I can, then I enjoy the process and I make progress. And before I know it, I finished a row, I finished a section, and then eventually I finished that sweater. <laughs> well, that sweater, I suppose, is reaching zero emissions overall. And obviously, when we think about that, that seems impossibly far away, especially at this really difficult moment at the end of 2024. But if instead we think about all those steps we can make, prioritizing the most important steps and doing them as beautifully as we can, stitching them and weaving them into the world around us, then before we know it, we've made profound progress. And hopefully, eventually, we finish that sweater. So yeah, <laughs> I'd like to end this video at the end of 2024 by saying happy knitting for 2024 and 2025, both literally and figuratively. 
And I'm really excited to keep speaking with you all and building this community and understanding the climate around us as well as we possibly can. Okay, until next time. Bye. <laughs> I just finished a row. Can you see? Okay, well, that's nice. Ha <laughs>